Good morning, beloveds of Bradley. How's everyone doing? Good, good, good. I want to say a word, um, a happy Mother's Day, and recognize that lots of us were mothered in, in wonderful ways, lots of us were not, and it's a day for everyone. It's a day for mothering all around. It's also a day for graduates, and we're seeing them. They're kind of sprinkled around here. We got four of them here. We're so grateful. I want to say a word about um, those who are not here. The Kyles have three graduates this year, three graduates in three different states. Um, I don't know which state they're in today, but all the Kyles are there. So, so you'll recognize their pictures as you see them. Um, it's wonderful, and congratulations to all of you. Mr. Devon, congratulations to you and to Jennifer. Thank you, thank you. Um, I hope when you walked in, you noticed some signage in the building, some big electronic signs. Did you notice that? They're not working right now, but we have them. <laughs> so good for us. One of them is working, the one in the parlor. So when you go into the parlor to congratulate the graduates after church, you'll be able to see what that signage is like. They were just installed at the end of last week and we're still working to get them up and going. Thank you to Sue True and to the trustees for facilitating all of that working. It'll be great, it'll be great. So it's spring, which leads to summer, which leads to the Strawberry Festival. And I, I don't know if anything else goes on in the summer, but the Strawberry Festival does right here. Pre-sale tickets will start next week, and you'll want to get them because we ran out of tickets last year. So you'll want to get them. They'll be in the parlor after church next week. Um, let me see. A couple of updates on folks who are on our prayer list. Charlotte Greiner is doing well. Her surgery went very well, so we're grateful for that. And Bill Smith has a new hip. After nine months of waiting, he has his new hip, and he's doing well. He's home. Anyone else we need to be remembering or anything else? Thank you. I worked hard at that. I worked real hard at that birthday. Thank you. This, yesterday was my birthday. Today's my son's birthday. And in three days is our daughter-in-law's birthday. So we don't know which day is which these five days, do we? Yeah, we just keep celebrating. Well, thank you. Now let's um, focus on what we're here for. <laughs> so we all come here with um, stuff, good stuff and sometimes not so good stuff. So we're going to take just a few minutes to take a couple of deep breaths and let the stuff go so that nothing is preventing us from being fully in God's presence. So let's take a few minutes to just still ourselves and to breathe in the breath of God. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Let us worship God. Please stand as you are able and join together in our call to worship. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ, our shepherd, you call to us. Lead us to your heart and guide us in the ways of peace. We let go of our old ways and live our life in Christ. We receive our old ways of living and grant us new life that we may serve you in love all of our days. Christ, 
gentle shepherd, bless us and lead us in your ways. We offer our hearts in worship to you. join together in our opening prayer. God of grace, when we are lost, you give us direction. When we are defeated, you give us courage. When we are weak, you give us strength. When we are dead, you raise us to life. Come to the place in our hearts where we are in need and take our hand and raise us up with your word. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I'm not certain that we have little ones with us today. I know that Cameron and Ryder are with their mom today, so we're grateful for that. So, so just be young at heart for now, okay? Just everyone, get yourselves young at heart. If you need to stomp your feet to come in, go for it. <laughs> okay. So that was the children's sermon. <laughs> um, I, I was going to ask the kids, so I'm going to ask you, and um, it's not a rhetorical question, it's a question for you to answer aloud if you so desire. Who first told you about Jesus? Your parents, grandma, mom, your father, Sunday school teacher, that's what it was for me. Do you know those people's names? Well, moms and dads, you probably do. <laughs> and who best taught you then how to live as if you follow and believe and trust and love Jesus? Mom and dad. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it, to um, have that. I was going to have the kids thank mom and dad, but let's take a moment now to thank moms and dads and grandparents and Sunday school teachers and youth fellowship leaders and the neighbor lady down the street who played the organ every Saturday night to get us going for Sunday. Let's just take a moment to thank them. Let us pray. Holy God, you sent these beloved saints into our life. We can see them in our minds, memory, and in our hearts, love. We hear their voices, and we know their love. Thank you for placing them in our lives, and thank you for opening our hearts and our ears and our minds and our spirit so that we could hear the story of your son. Bless them and bless us. 
as we follow your son, as we learn to live in love with one another. Amen. Please stand as you are comfortable for our scripture reading. Our lesson today comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, verses 36 through 43. Now in Joppa there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men with him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. This is the word of God. Thanks Thanks be to God.
Please be seated. Let's have a word of prayer. Holy God, as your word is opened, open our hearts and our minds and our spirits so that you might speak to our lives in ways that move us, in ways that help us to grow, in ways that help us to live in love with one another. Amen. So does anyone here remember First it was a story, uh, a book in the 1950s, and then it was a movie in the late 1980s, The Last Temptation of Christ. It was quite controversial. Um, I was in seminary when the movie came out, and you know, when you're in seminary, anything that has the word Jesus or God or Christ, you think you gotta pay attention to. <laughs> so I picked up the book and I read it quick, although it's a, a book to get through, and then I, then I saw the movie. And it's quite a remarkable movie and, and, and even a more remarkable book. It's about Jesus as he was on the cross, sort of having a dream, a hallucination about what could have been. And in his dream and in his hallucination, he was, as um, he describes, not quite in these words, but kind of a regular guy. You know, someone who grew up and got married and had children and took care of his family and did the stuff that lots of people do that he hadn't had a chance to do in his life. Well, you don't know that it's a hallucination. You think it's the real deal until the end of the book when Jesus needs to make the choice whether he will give himself up to God or whether he'll dwell a little while in being just a regular guy. Which do you think he chose? Door number one <laughs> or door number two, I'll tell you. He chose door number two. Even in the book, he gave up what was of the world so that he could be of God. I think that's quite a remarkable story. And I can remember when I finished it, I was a little, felt a little badly for Jesus because he didn't get to get what I got, which was a family and a kind of regular life. But in the end, I decided that maybe he had it right after all. And I still remain there after 40 years. I still think that um, you'll be glad to know. So Jesus had an opportunity, at least in the book, and I'm not talking the book meaning the Bible, I'm talking about the book, The Last Temptation of Christ. He had a chance for a do-over, so to speak. He could have his life go a different way if he wanted it. He chose to stay the way that God had him go. But the Bible is full of stories of people who had do-overs. Enough that I had to write them out. I couldn't remember them. But I'm going to start with two stories, three stories, from the Old Testament, both having to do with Elijah and Elisha, who were great prophets of the Old Testament time. And when Jesus came along, or any new prophet came along, they were all compared to Elijah and Elijah. Uh, can you believe this? This is Elisha and Elijah. Both of them were prophets of the word, but prophets also of the do-over. They gave people do-overs. So the first one was this. Elijah stayed in the house of a woman and uh, kind of lived there while he was doing his ministry. And the, in the midst of his living there, her, her son died. So when Elijah got back, the woman said, oh, my son is dead. And so Elijah went into the boy's room and touched him, and he came back to life. That's the end of the story. The next story is from Elisha, who also did the same thing. He was staying with a woman, knew a woman, and um, when her son died, he touched the boy, and he came back to life. And that's the end of that story. The final story. 
An Israelite was captured by the Moabites well after the time of Elijah and Elisha. So in order to um, make him um, in captivity in the best way they could think of, they threw him into Elijah's tomb. Now, this is an odd story. We don't talk about this story too much, but just think about this. He's being held captive by the Moabite army, and they need to move on, so they throw him into Elijah's tomb, where they thought he would die. But when he touched the bones of Elijah, the tomb opened up, and he could leave. That's the end of that story. So when Jesus came along, before Jesus had great acclaim, at least in Israel, they didn't know what kind of prophet he would be and how he would compare to Elijah and Elisha. So Jesus, not to prove who he was, but because of who he was, as you know, began to give people second chances. Ten leopards... Go and wash in the pool, Jesus said. And when you come out, you'll be clean. And they washed in the pool, and they were clean. And Jesus moved on. That's a do-over. Two men came to him blind. Jesus touched their eyes, and they could see. And that story repeats itself over and over with single people. That's the end of those stories, too. Their eyes are touched, they can see. Jesus, as you know, wore a robe like this, and someone touched his robe, a woman touched his robe, and the bleeding that she'd had for years and years and years immediately stopped, simply because she touched his robe. Those with demons, the demons were cast out in Jesus' presence. Someone was lame, they could walk when Jesus touched them. You couldn't hear, you couldn't speak. Jesus would touch and you could see and hear and speak. And so frequently when that happened, the onlookers would say, this man is like Elijah and Elisha. So that story of people getting a second chance continued on with Jesus. So after Jesus only recorded twice. You heard one of the stories. The other one was when Paul was preaching and um, in a small room and a man was sitting on the window ledge and he fell out and died. So Pete, Paul, or Peter went out, Paul went out. Oh my goodness, Paul went out and touched him and he came back to life. Peter, you heard the story today of Tabitha, who was well known in her city for all of the wonderful things she did. And in fact, when she died, her women friends showed people the garments that she had made and how talented and gifted she was in giving and generous and in love with Jesus. And Peter sent them all outside and touched her and said, Tabitha, get up. And she did. All of those stories of um, second chances, of do-overs, of answering the question, what could I do if I had it all over to do? All of those stories end in the same way. Nobody knows what happened to the people who got the do-overs. Not a single word is written about how their life was changed. All we know is that in some way they were given a new chance at life. We have no clue what they did with that. Hmm. So, have you ever had a do-over? A chance to do something again? You know, I don't know what that might be for you. Anyone want to share that? I've had a few of them, but I'm not certain that what I did with those was worth writing about. 
you know, daily, in and out, time and time again, God, through Jesus, through those we know, through um, medical science, gives us do-overs. It doesn't just happen once in a lifetime. It maybe happens once a day or once an hour or every minute. We're getting a chance to answer that question. If I could do it all over again, what would I do? Well, that's not a rhetorical question. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with the time that you get when God says, you're forgiven, move on. I love you, don't forget that. I'm here with you, I'll never leave you. What you've said, what you've done, it don't make any difference in my eyes. I just love you. What are you going to do with that? Are you going to have your life story be, well, she had a do-over, but nobody knows what she did with her do-over? Are you going to have the kind of life that says, oh my, God touched this person, and oh my, what that life was like? You know, we don't have to have any acclaim at all. We don't have to be recognized for what we do. It's nice, but it doesn't need to happen. But when God touches us, something ought to be happening, don't you think? Don't you think? So I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to expect today that that's going to happen to you that God's going to touch you in some way that you're going to get a do-over. And then expect that your life will change because you've been touched by God. You willing? You willing to expect that? Let's do it. Let's see what happens when this church, all together, we get to answer that question. What would I do if I had to do it over? Well, here's what I do because God has touched me and my life is different and I'm going to move on differently because of that. Let's see what happens. So one of my favorite poets, Mary Oliver, are you familiar with Mary Oliver? She's a, a pretty prolific poet. Um, writer. She wrote this in the 80s. It's called The Summer Day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? The grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. So tell me, what else should I have done? Tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild, precious life? Isn't that the question? What are you going to do with your one wild, precious life when God touches you and it gets a little wilder and a whole lot more precious? Let us pray. Holy God, touch us. Help our hearts to swell a little bit and our spirits to soar. Help our hands to feel your guidance and our minds to know your wisdom. And let it not just settle, but let it help us to move forward in your grace and in your mercy, to touch the lives of others, 
and to be fully and wholly engaged in your world. We offer ourselves to you for another do-over, the daily do-over, so that we will know what you have in mind with our one wild, precious life. Amen. We come to that time where we have an opportunity to give back. So I ask you to be generous, be mindful of those people who need a do-over in life, those people whom God is trying to reach through us. So I ask the ushers to come forward so that we might give of ourselves. God, bless these gifts even as you have blessed our lives. 
Let them be for those who receive it, a sign of your love and of your grace. And may your world continue to grow in such, in love and in grace. Amen. Please be seated. Let us be in an attitude of prayer. Thank you, O oh God, for the joy of today. And here we are, it's still morning, and yet so many things have come our way. Just the simple joy of shelter and clean water, of food on the table, of friends who get us, and the joy of meeting new friends. And in this time and space, we gather in body and spirit to thank you especially for the joy of worshiping you, our creator. The joys with which we are blessed, we are grateful, and yet, in all honesty, we admit that we come with some fears, too. Some of us have fears about new beginnings, new schools, new relationships, new jobs. We don't know how we'll do or how we'll feel. We're nervous. We want things to go well. We need you. Some of us have fears about our health or the health of a loved one aches and pains that don't go away, symptoms that we can't figure out, treatments that we hope, oh, we hope, will be effective. Some of us have financial fears. Will we find work? Is our work secure? How can we pay these bills? Have we saved enough for the future? Some have fears of loneliness that strike us all at some point fear that we won't have people to love us or we'll lose the people we already love. So God of hope, be with us in our fears and even in the midst of them, we still give you thanks. Help us to find joy that you bring even in the midst of fears or sorrow. Thank you for your faithfulness through time, for ways you have been with us in the past, for ways that you remind us that nothing can separate us from your love. This week, help us to have compassion for those, for those who are fleeing bombs and bullets, who face governments that are oppressive, who cannot worship openly, but meet in secret, who fear violence. Help us to be people of refuge, those who offer help and support, who go the extra mile when we see people in need. Forgive us for the times when we're too wrapped up in our own fears and joys to truly see our neighbor. This week, help us to embrace joyful living, be mindful of the gift of each day, Remembering our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives in us and through us, and who invites us now to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to stand together now to sing the hymn, This is a Day of New Beginnings. And on the fourth verse, I'm going to ask the graduates to come down and meet me here, right here. Oh. We'll sing a cappella, or do you want to play on? Okay. So, you know, it's all in the details, isn't it? Okay, so we're going to sing a cappella, and you're going to join us, and you're going to join us here as a graduate. Okay, there, now we're set to go. Let's stand together and sing.
that love can do. This is a day of new beginnings. Our God is making all things new. Yeah. Okay, we'll end there. <laughs> Please be seated. What a day, what a day. Is everyone here graduated? You, you, when do you graduate? June 4th. June 4th. I'm gonna let these folks introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about yourself, what your plans are, what's God doing in your life. Just tell us the details of everything. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna let you go first, is that okay? Tell us your name. Madeline King. And how are you related here in the church? Um, Rita's my grandma. Rita's her grandma. So congratulations to you too, Rita. And where are you graduating from? Uh, Greenfield High School. Good for you. What are you going to do? I uh, plan on going to college. Good for you. Good for yeah. you. And this is, you tell them who you are and say it. Hi, my name's Jennifer Johnston. I'm Dr. Johnston. <laughs> I graduated from Butler University yesterday with my doctor in medical science. I work at a family practice on the south side of Indianapolis in Greenwood. And how are you related to the church? Janice and Rick are my parents. Okay. Hi, I'm Tyler Kennedy. Um, I graduated from Butler University with my doctor of pharmacy. Um, I will be starting a pharmacy residency in June at Ascension St. Vincent. And my parents, Rick and Susan, are here today. And my Aunt Julie. Hi, I'm Devin. I think you all know me. Uh, <laughs> I'm related to the church because I play here. Uh, and yeah, this is now my church family. So uh, I just graduated from Indiana University with my Bachelor of Music, uh, and I'm starting my master's in the fall, so that means I will be here for another two years at least. So. Um, I want to read everyone's name because they need to kind of float through this room, and you know, you know many, many of these people. <clears throat> and then when we're through reading the names, I'm going to ask their family and friends to come forward, and we're going to lay on hands like good Methodists do and pray over these, these young people. Congratulations to all of you. <clears throat> so here are our graduates. Will Huffman, Abigail Jessup, Dr. Jennifer Johnston, Eric Kyle, Aaron Kyle, Ethan Kyle, Tyler Kennedy, Madeline King, Devin Shaw, and Thomas Warner. Okay, I'm going to ask you to step down here, and I'm going to have you turn and face the altar behind you. And, and family and friends, come forward, and we'll, we'll bless these kids. This is like a, this is like a um, reveal for you. Rita had both her knees replaced how long ago? Valentine's Day. On Valentine's Day. <laughs> Look at her. <laughs> All right, friends, let's be in an attitude of prayer. God of truth and knowledge, by your wisdom, we are taught the way and the truth. Bless these beautiful people before you as they have finished their courses of study. We thank you for those who taught them and worked beside them and all who supported them along the way. Be with these graduates as they leave and move forward in life. Strengthen their many gifts and talents. Instill in them a confidence in the future you plan where their energies may be gathered up and used for the good of all people. May their dreams for the future blend with yours and make this world a better place. Amen blessing on all of you. I have something for you. Thank you. Congratulations.
sing. benediction and um, the final singing of the last verse here. I invite you to come to the parlor. We'll receive all of the graduates and have a chance to welcome them and wish them all good speed and Godspeed and um, good luck all as they enter into the world in a new and fresh way, leading us, leading us. <clears throat> and now, friends, and now friends, may the grace of God May the grace of God and the love of Jesus and the love of Jesus and the communion with the Holy Spirit and the communion with the Holy Spirit bless guard and keep you bless guard and keep you this day this day and always and always go in peace go in peace to live. So let your heart and your spirit and your mind and your whole being be touched by God. 
and move forward in such a way that the world will know that you are one of the beloveds. I'm going to ask you to be seated now so that you can hear the postlude. <laughs> 